Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. I think we will be concluding the book of Acts today. We will see how far we get, but we pick it up in chapter 6, not 6, I'm sorry, 26, verse 24. So get your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 26. Just a quick reminder to you that Scripture Verse by Verse can be heard and in some cases viewed at the Scripture Verse by Verse website website, which is found at the Bible versebyverse.com. You can study the whole Bible at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages, just like we're going to do today at the Bible versebyverse.com. And Father, today we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 26, verse 24. And as he thus spoke, and this is Paul, appealing to King Agrippa. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. This reminds me of the testimony, actually, that was meant meant to be an insult to the Christians of that day. People, the Jews were saying, they turned Jerusalem upside down. Remember what I said? They didn't turn Jerusalem upside down. Jerusalem's already upside down. It still is today, and so is the rest of this confused, sin-darkened world. It's all upside down. Christians come along, proclaim the pure word of God, and try to turn it right side up. But people are so confused in the world as to what is right and wrong and good and bad and true and false that they think upside down is right side up. But I get the feeling that Paul did not make a good impression on Festus. What do you think? Festus thinks that Paul is, is, uh, is serving and suffering for a dead man and a dead man's religion. He must believe that because he called Jesus a dead man. Now, it is good that God has not commanded his people to impress the world, or we who teach the word of God straight would be miserable failures. Well, the truth sure did not impress Festus. He thought that Paul was crazy. Verse 25. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things. He's talking about King Agrippa, who's standing there too, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. The events of Christ, his life, his miracles, his teaching, and his death were not secret. Agrippa knew the facts about Jesus, as did a lot of people. Ignorance was not Agrippa's problem. His problem was that he never repented and submitted to Christ. And that lack of personal application is enough to damn him and any soul to hell. So what if you believe the facts about Jesus? Big deal. That doesn't save you. Anybody who tells you that believing the facts about Jesus saves you from hell is wrong. They're lying to you. They are a tool of the devil. It's not true. It's not true. The devils believe and they tremble. Faith without works is dead. Agrippa believed, but he wasn't saved. 28, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Paul was their prisoner, but he did not hate them. He wanted them to have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, just as he did. And so we see that years of unfair treatment was not enough to get him to become bitter toward those who mistreated him. And that's because he loved Jesus. You love Jesus, you're not going to be better toward anyone, no matter what they've done to you. 30. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they sat, that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Someone says Paul made a mistake when he appealed to Caesar because he could have been set free if he had not done that. Well, humanly speaking, I guess maybe he did make a mistake, but God can turn mistakes into opportunities. Don't second guess your mistakes. Yeah, if need be, learn from them. But if you did it, you did it. If you made a mistake, you made a mistake, okay? Don't sit back and get all depressed 
second guessing your mistakes. Don't worry about possible mistakes in your past. Only be concerned about putting God first today, even in the midst of the consequences of your mistakes, and trust that he is sovereign, trust that his providence is at work, and trust that he will turn any mistakes into opportunities. That's exactly what is happening with the Apostle Paul. Okay. Chapter 27, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band. Some of the prisoners who traveled with Paul were destined to become gladiators. And after that, food for the lions. They don't know it, but they are very fortunate. Paul is there to tell them about the Savior so they can be saved before they get ripped to shreds by the lion, too. And entering into a ship of Adramatium, we put to sea, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon. And Julius courteously treated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Verse 4, And when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. They sailed south of the island of Cyprus to avoid the north wind which blew that time of the year. Verse 5. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and we put and he put us on board. So they transferred Paul to a ship which came from northern Africa and was headed for Italy. Remember, he's going to Rome because he appealed to Caesar. Verse 7, And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarcely were come off Canundus, the wind not permitting us, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmone, and passing it with difficulty, came unto the, to a place which is called Fair Havens, near to which was the city of Lycia. Verse 9, And when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. They wanted to make it to Rome before the stormy weather hit in late fall, but it had taken longer than what they had expected. It's almost winter, and they are really cutting it close. People did not sail late in the year. It was just way too dangerous, but they're treading on thin ice, as it were, right now. Verse 10, <clears throat> and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with injury and much damage, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And to be honest, I don't blame the man in charge for taking the advice of a captain over the advice of a tent maker, since it involved sailing. Verse 12, <clears throat> And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the greater part advised to depart from there also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenicia and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they obtained their purpose, loosing from there they sailed close by Crete. In other words, the crew crossed their fingers and set sail. And this late, it was a real gamble. Unfortunately, many do that with regards to their immortal soul. They cross their fingers and they hope for the best. I had a man tell me that several years ago. He didn't know what to believe. He wasn't going to believe the Bible, but he thought he would just do what he thought was best and hope for the best in eternity. I'm not willing to roll the dice on my immortal soul. I want to believe about heaven and hell and salvation. Whatever Jesus believed, that's what I want to believe. And he believed in the written word of God, and he believed that he was the only way to get to heaven and to avoid hell. I'm going with it. Verse 14, but not long after, 
there arose against it a tempestuous wind called the Urak Lydon, and now their worst nightmare has come to pass. A powerful northeast wind is blowing down from Europe, and that means trouble. Verse 15, And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the lee of a certain island, which is called Kuda, we had much work to secure the boat, which when they had hoisted it, they used helps undergirding the ship. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, struck sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackle of the ship. And when, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So they used all the experience that they had. They used all the strength that they had. They did everything humanly possible, but they knew it was not enough. They admitted, that's it. It's all over. We're finished. And you know, that's actually a good place to be, especially spiritually, if you're a lost sinner. It's good to recognize that you are washed up, spiritually speaking, that in spite of all your efforts, you can't do it. You can't get right with God. And that's one, one reason that God gave us his law. We read it, and if we are honest, we say, I'm dead. I'm in big trouble. I can't do it. I need a Savior, and I need God's mercy. And, and these guys were backed into a corner right now with nowhere to go. They had lost all hope. Physically speaking, they thought they were dead. <clears throat> Verse 21, And after being long without food, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. Looks like Paul could not resist saying, I told you so. It's not right to do that, you know. And later, Paul himself, while inspired with the Holy Spirit, wrote, Love does not rejoice in wrong, and love is not boastful. And we see Paul from this was a sinner also. 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. However, we must be cast upon a certain island. Now I would listen to Paul over the captain, because now he's not speaking as if he knows more about sailing than the captain of a ship. Now he is speaking the word of God. Now he's worth listening to. Everyone was weak and tired and afraid, except Paul. He was not. They were all sure they would die. Paul knew he would not. He knew he would make it to Rome because God told him what he would. And not only that, God sent an angel and gave him the assurance that he would make it. Gave him another promise. Paul trusted completely in the word of God, and that is what gave him peace. You will never have peace if you don't trust in the written word of Almighty God. If you put your trust in circumstances, in finances, in people, you will never have peace. you got to put your trust in the Word of God. Look to it. Look to God. Live for Him, and you will have peace. 27, but when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the sailors deemed that they drew near to some country. Verse 28, and sounded and found it 20 fathoms, and when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should fall upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Verse 30, and as the sailors were about to flee out of the ship, 
when they had let down the boat into the sea under pretense as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. So these guys are going to bail out. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. So if the sailors follow their instincts and jump ship, they're going to die for sure. They have to obey God. They have to hang in there with the boat. You know, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We must always stay within the boundaries of God's word and not bail out, even when all of our instincts tell us to bail. Faith means not doing anything unscriptural, even when you are afraid to be scriptural. It means believing and living the Bible and trusting God with the outcome. That's what it means to live by faith. 32. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. They decide to obey and ride out the storm. This is good. These unbelievers are trusting in the word of God. <clears throat> Verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take food, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I beseech you to take some food, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fail, fall I should say, from the head of any of you. Believe the word is the lesson. And the rest of that lesson is use common sense. Believe the word, but use common sense. You won't die, says Paul, but eat something because you haven't eaten in 14 days. They need physical strength to survive as God said they would. But God is not going to just zap them with physical strength. They have to eat. It is wrong to trust God and do nothing when you can trust God and do something. <clears throat> Verse 35. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Paul honors God by thanking him for the food in front of all the prisoners and all the sailors. Verse 36. <clears throat> then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some food. And we were in all in the ship 276 souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They already threw their cargo overboard. Now they throw their extra food overboard as well. It's amazing how the things that people sometimes work so hard for and even covet at times become meaningless when their life is at stake. 39. And when it was day, they recognized not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the bow struck fast and remained unmovable. But the stern was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they who could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped safely to the land. God did not say how he would get these men to land safely. If he would have showed them his plan in advance, 
they would not have liked it. But God got them there, and that's the important thing. God keeps his promises, but often how he gets us from point A to point B is not the route that we would expect or choose. <clears throat> Verse 20, or chapter 28. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. Verse 2. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. So these quote unquote barbarians showed common courtesy to Paul, whereas the Jews, who were supposed to be civilized, were full of self and full of hatred for Paul because he wanted people like these barbarians to go to heaven. You know, some of the most barbaric sinners to God are the so-called civilized people of the world. Verse 3, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Add one more trial to Paul's resume. Verse 4, and when, these, and when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet justice alloweth not to live. The natives worshipped an idol who was called Justice, and they think that this God of Justice got Paul back for the sin of murder with this snake bite. But it's wrong to assume that bad things only happen to bad people and good things only happen to good people. And they're going to learn that real quick. Notice verse 5. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. However, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their mind and said that he was a god. To talk about fickle, Paul was promised that he would make it to Rome, so it doesn't matter how poisonous that viper is, its venom, venom is not going to kill him, and he knows it. But, but this crowd that had seen it all, first they thought he was a murderer because he got bit, then he thought he was a god because he didn't die, and it was just God. God was behind the scenes doing all this stuff. When God makes an unconditional promise, nothing in this world can stop it from coming to pass, not even a poisonous snake bite. Verse 7, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. So the governor was very nice to the strangers, to Paul and company. Verse 8, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So God heals the governor's father through the apostle Paul. It was God's way of showing that he cares about all people, even those who do not know him, even those who do not worship him, even those who are on some remote island somewhere and don't know the first thing about the truth of God's word. Verse 9. So when this was done, others also in the island who had diseases came and were healed. So the news of the healing spread quickly. And as a result, many sick people came to Paul and God healed them all as well, proving that God does not just care about the so-called important people of the world, like the governor, but also he cares about the common person who many might overlook. Verse 10, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they placed on board such things as were necessary. They were grateful and they were generous and they were showing their appreciation for what Jesus did for them through the apostle Paul on that island. And that, by the way, is faith. That is real saving faith. Saving faith shows its appreciation for Christ by doing good works. Verse 11. Verse 11. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. These twin gods are better known to us as Gemini. 
People believed that these twin gods protected sailors. Pagans have gods for everything because they don't believe that any one god of theirs is big enough to handle everything by himself. Verse 12, and landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from there we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Pitoli. Verse 14, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. Paul finds some Christians in this place. And that place was a long way from Israel. But those who were saved on Pentecost, remember, were from all over the empire. And evidently some were from here and they returned to this area and spread the message of Christ and the church spread even to this area before Paul arrived. Verse 15, and from there, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Paul had never met these Christians before, but their kindness was an encouragement to him. Christians have a real bond with each other, even those that they have never met before. And you know what that bond is? That bond is the Holy Spirit. That bond that you feel with other Christians who love God, love Jesus, and love his word is proof that the Holy Spirit is in you. You know, I don't feel a bond with everybody who claims to be a Christian. I don't feel a bond at all with modern Christians, with many of them. I just don't. Because they're too obsessed with being cool in the eyes of the world. And you can't even talk to them about the Word of God and Jesus. You can talk to them about, about Jesus and the Word of God, but they're so shallow because they're so into the world that I have no connection with them at all. I have more of a connection with an unsaved person than with many people who call themselves Christians. Verse 16, and when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Paul was under house arrest. He was not in prison, but he was guarded. God allowed Paul to be guarded by Roman soldiers. And I'll give you one good reason why. So that those guards could hear the word of God, could hear about Jesus. And as a result, many of them were saved. Verse 17, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had anything to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. In other words, Paul says, the reason that I am bound with this chain is because I proclaim the Messiah, the hope of Israel. I knew, I know who he is. Verse 21, and they said unto him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spoke any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And that would include the whole Old Testament. And he did it from morning till evening, the Bible says, verse 24, and some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not, which was always the case. Paul spoke all those Old Testament prophecies about a Messiah and Savior and how they were all fulfilled in Christ. Some believed, some did not. 
25. And when they had agreed not among themselves, they departed. After Paul had spoken one word, well spoke the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing, ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing, ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is become obtuse, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. God is not willing that any should perish, perish but that all should come to repentance. But he will not force the truth on anyone. If somebody is open to truth, if they truly are open to truth, when they hear the word of God, they will respond by receiving it. If they're not open, it doesn't matter what kind of an argument you make. It doesn't matter if you're the great apostle Paul. You're not going to convince them. It's the same old story. It happens everywhere. 28. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great disputing among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And this book ends with Paul remaining obedient to the Lord's command to pro boldly proclaim Jesus Christ and the word of God. And actually the book of Acts continues, though it is not written down, it continues because the church continues. The acts of the church of Jesus Christ will not conclude until Jesus returns. And each one of us who knows Christ are included somewhere in this story. We all have a job to do. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture, verse by verse. So long, everyone.